All right, folks, welcome everybody. Thank you uh, for coming out today on behalf of uh, Nagios. My name is Emmett, I'm the announcer today. Um, we'll be doing some uh, Q&A, some uh, about 10 minute questions towards the end of this uh, presentation. But uh, without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, put your hands together for Robert Bolton, Systems Administrator at the University of Utah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Robert Bolton. I'm a systems administrator at the University of Utah. I'll just will tell you a bit about where I work at, what I do, and you know, a little bit of personal information about me. Uh, I work for the Center for High Performance Computing on the campus of the University of Utah. We are essentially, I like to refer to us as the research IT department. Uh, our, we, our university is a research institution. We have a research hospital and just traditional research in, in several different fields. Our department is in charge of the computational clusters and, you know, researchers, they have interesting things they're trying to research. They use computers in interesting ways that do not fit in the normal campus infrastructure. So they come to us to help solve their problems. And this creates a lot of interesting uh, things that we have to monitor that just, you know, we have trouble because we can't find, you know, Nagios plugins out there that allow us to monitor you know certain things, so we've been able to uh, extend o um, SNMP to be allow us to monitor things that you normally wouldn't think about. Uh, just a little bit about me: I like to code stuff in Python, so this is a talk about Python uh, and the particularly the SNMP pass uh, persist module that allows you to update uh, OIDs. Uh, I'm also go, you know working at the university has some benefits too, so I'm actually going to school part time. I'm deciding between computer engineering, electrical engineering, I haven't really decided. And going part time, I have no idea when I'm going to graduate. Uh, I did notice that people in IT tend to have some kind of geek credibility, whether they like you know, fantasy novels or comic books. I like board games, and I'm a ham radio operator. And I, I think that's enough geek cred about me. <laughs> All right, so let's, enough about me. Let's talk about what you guys came to hear about. And that's uh, creating a, um, custom OIDs so that you can extend your monitoring environment. Uh, things we're going to cover today, you know, why bother doing this? Uh, we're going to cover the OIT structure because if you decide, hey, I want to create some custom OIDs, where am I going to stick them at? Uh, we're going to cover the uh, Python module that allows you to do this. And I'm going to give you a real, a real world example using IO stat, uh, statistics for di uh, file system disk, and it, so that you'll be un understand where we. We had an issue with this and how we solved it using uh, custom OIDs. So the first thing you want to think about is why do I want to do this? Uh, SNMP, for one thing, it's simple to, to gather data from it. And simple is in quotations because if you've ever messed with the SNMP, you'll know that sometimes it works a little bit and sometimes it doesn't give you the results that you're looking for. Uh, it, it's essentially a server says, hey, give me this information here, and the other server says, okay, I'll pass it to you. But sometimes they don't talk on the uh, same wavelength, it seems. Uh, another thing, and you probably wonder, why would I want to do this? I mean, if I'm using Nagios, there's probably a plugin out there, and if there's not, it's pretty simple to write a plugin to gather the information you need. But it doesn't allow you to sometimes pass off that information and share that information between uh, not only in Nagios, but we also, you know, use Cacti to historically track what happens. So a Nagios plugin might be great for gathering data that you need for um, Nagios, but how, how do you get that information into Cacti to, uh, you know, to be able to trend that? Um, a good example is if we, you know, use an NRPE to execute a, a remote command on a, a server will give you the result that you're looking for to, to say, oh, is this, you know, is this, at a state that I expect it to be at, whereas that doesn't really translate to um, this, you know, this state or this value doesn't really translate very well to a different system such as, you know, cacti. Um, also, it gives a chance to offload time-consuming system checks. And what I mean by that is I have a, a few scripts that go out there and do some weird stuff. Like, for instance, I have a script that goes out and monitors the temperature sensor of all 500 compute nodes in one of our clusters so that I can create a weather map and determine where the hot spots are of, with airflow flowing into that custom on that, on that cluster. It takes about 15 minutes to run because querying the, uh, the little drag that's on the uh, servers takes a while. And you obviously could not do that 
in the time window of or a cacti, for instance, or even Nagios, unless you had some enormous window that you were going to do. And also, I have another script that goes out and queries every network they have, how many devices are on that, and that takes about five minutes to run. And like I said, that you know that taking that outside of Nagios or outside of your monitoring software allows it to uh, you know, not get bogged down with useless checks. Well, not, not, I shouldn't say useless, but time-consuming checks that the system might otherwise deem as, um, you know, you have to wait for this one before I can go to the process, and that can, you know, fill up the queue quite quickly. Um, also, using custom OIDs, you can provide information that's not normally inside of the uh, OID tree. The OID tree consists of a lot of information, such, you know, like interface statistics. You can gather, um, you know, memory, CPU utilization, stuff like that out of the tree. But there's other things that we have discovered that we'd want that isn't in the tree that we have to put there ourselves. So let's just go ahead and talk a little bit about the tree structure. I have this uh, nice little graphic I found that it, um, shows a little bit about it. You might be a little bit familiar with some of the, t the top of the tree. If you've worked with SNMP enough, you'll start to notice numbers. And you, you get really good at it. You can look at a number and tell exactly what it is. I'm not at that level, and I don't know if anybody is in here, but if you are, that's pretty impressive. So the first thing you'll notice is that we have the root of the tree, uh, tree being in an in, in inverted sense here. But So you'll notice that 1.3.6.1. You'll notice that a lot. Is, you know, that's pretty much a good indication of you know, what the base of every OID is. And in, you know, as it flows down here, there's different levels. Uh, what we're going to prim primarily focus on is after um, the internet level, where it starts to branch out, there's a, uh, a dot four, when this is the private branch of the tree. And this is where we're going to stick our custom OIDs. And the reason we do that is uh, if, you, if you're querying an OID, it will respond to whatever OID. It'll give you information. And if you stick some custom information in there, it'll respond with that custom information which is, is fine if that's the, w the way you want to run your environment, but if you're good producing a product and you just pick some OID willy-nilly, you might be overriding something that's the, you know, a standard, like an interface statistic. So that's why you'll see a lot of, if you look at the OID tree, you'll see a lot of vendors, they'll put their stuff under four. Uh, we'll put our custom OIDs under four, just so we don't clobber you know, you know, things. And there's also an experimental branch too, and I've seen people stick stuff in the experimental branch, and they think, well, it's experimental, I'll just stick it there, whatever. Uh, sometimes vendors will say, well, I want to offer these statistics in this experimental branch so that I can just, you know, that's one more thing, I, feature I can brag about. So that's why I like to put it in the uh, four structure as opposed to somewhere else. Uh, if you're a vendor or you work for one, it's not that difficult for your, your company to go out and get a uh, dedicated number. Like, for instance, since, um, you know, we use 4.1234 as our, you know, our top of our tree. But if, you, you know, if you're a vendor, you can go out and get whatever you would like. And um, you'll see a lot of vendors, you know, like APCs in there, Dell, Juniper, stuff like that. They all have uh, branches in their, for their statistics in that, along with other standard statistics that they're offering through, like, you know, interface statistics for, for Cisco, for example. All right. Uh, this slide pretty much covers up covers anything I didn't mention there. Uh, numbers correspond to a location, so it's kind of like a street address or IP address. You know, this number corresponds to this location. Uh, there's a what they call the management information base or the MIB file. Uh, this is what translate these. This is what helps translate these numbers into more of a human uh, readable portion. And like I said, you know, 1.3.6.1.4 is the top of the private branch, and that's where vendors and our custom ORDs are going to live. So uh, we're going to talk about Python and the SNMP pass persist module for a second. So why did I write it in Python? That's because that's what I know. Uh, just getting some ideas about this when I was first starting, I found out that you can you can interact with the OID tree structure in Perl. I don't really know Perl. I don't really, I, I'm not a fan of the brackets. So if you want to use Perl, you can use that. 
So I don't know if any other language is, it allows you to interact with OID tree structures, but I imagine if there's not, there you know it's it's probably a pretty simple process to do. Uh, so the this SNMP pass persist module, I found it on GitHub uh, under the uh, Nagus user. He he is the one that created this, and he just had it. You know the most current version is out there, and it requires net SNMP. So if it runs on a, on a Linux machine, or you can use a net SNMP, you can use this module. Installation is pretty easy. You just download the source, you know, just install it like you do a normal, you know, run the setup script and install it normally. And to use the module, you do, um, you just import, you know, import the module. And I, so I just import it and call it SNMP. So uh, I have a script right here. It'll show you exactly what it does. And we'll go, we'll go through the script. And I, I told you guys I'd give you a real life example. I actually lied. I'm actually going to give you two real life examples. Uh, this script right here, what we've had issues with is we have a, like our atmospheric science department. We, we, we take care of them. And they have a lot of research data with uh, historical radar data. The radar files are very tiny. They're like kilobytes in size. However, there's millions and millions and millions of these little files, and we've actually ran out of inodes before we ran out of disk space. So this um, goes out and queries the file system and finds out how many inodes are in use and how many, you know, so we can say, oh, you know, you're 10% before you run out. So we can, we can warn on that. We can also graph historical data. And basically what, we do, what we're doing, can you guys see this? Or is it, I was kind of worried if it's not big enough. So basically, we're going to import it, and then I, I established our base OID. So you'll, you'll notice that there's part of the top of the branch, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, that's the top of ours, and then 1.3, that's just the section that we put it, because we have it kind of structured out. So basically, I'm having two functions. I'm calling a, a, just like a df-ip command, and I'm cutting out the stuff I want. So basically, it just gives me a list of file systems. And then I'm doing the exact same thing, and then I'm cutting out the information for what inodes are in use for those. And then this is, this is the heart of the script right here. This is the update function. So basically, when you write your functions, you'll have an update function, or you call it whatever. But essentially, down here, down here you'll notice that I, I created an incident, instance of um, the pass persist, and I feed it my base OID. And then, you know, I can, I can say start this thing, feed it the function I want it to do, and update however long. So, I up, so what this does is it updates the, the OID tree every 60 seconds with the information out of this, uh, just, you know, querying the, the DF command. And basically, you know, I'll say, well, get, get the file systems, get the inode count, and then loop through that, create a, create a structure where it's basically file, uh, you know, it have base ID, one dot, whatever, you know, one, two, three, four, however many file systems I have will have uh, the, file name, the file system name. And then two dot, whatever, will have the, uh, the inode count. So I can correspond, there's corresponding, so, you know, one dot one and two dot one will, you know, they'll be tied together. So then I can query using um, Nagios or using, um, you know, Cacti, the total file systems I can say, I know how you know. I know how many inodes I want to warn on. Like, hey, I want a warning when it's you know getting to a certain level, and then I'll know that hey, we've reached, we've reached you know past this threshold. Maybe it's time to archi archive some of this data off. You know, maybe you really don't need all that weather data from 10 years ago, but apparently they do. You'll be surprised at the stuff people want to keep around. <laughs> So and then so this is what it'll, what it'll do is after I've created this script, I'll edit my SNMP comp file, and there's a line in there that says pass persist, and then the OID number, and it tells you to go to the script. And what that means is uh, when I restart SNMP, that script is not running until something queries that, and when it queries that, and it says, hey, I got a request for this branch of the OID. I don't normally know what it is. And I see this line that says, oh, pass it off to this script. This script will feed the results to me. And then so when I did an SNMP walk against it, this is the result. And, uh, you know, as you can tell, tell right here, this uh, file system is using, you know, this many inodes. I've noticed that in Cacti I had to create an index for it because 
Cacti tends to like to index things based off of a number. So that's what the one, two, three at the top is for. So, you know, number one will be this file system with this I, I know co count and so forth. So that kind of leads us into our, our another, you know, real world example. Oh, let me, let me just back up here. This is good for instantaneous stuff. So DF command is a pretty instantaneous command. So I run, issue a DF, it gives me the results, and that's, that's all well and good when you, you know, as Nagios queries in, you know, in real time, so it says, give me this, okay, I got it back. Now what happens if you have to query something that may take in a while to return the correct result, uh, like IOSTAT, for example. So in our real world example, we've had users complain about, and I don't know if everybody's heard this, but the network's slow. You blame the network for everything because it's the least understood part of the system they interact with. And so they'll say, well, I can't log in because, you know, it takes forever for my network, you know, get my network home directory, and really it's somebody might, they might have another home directory. They're running a, you know, some compute job that's writing da data to that home directory. It exists on the same file system. So the file system is getting hammered. And it's the reason they can't log in is because it's, it's pretty slow. And we tell them all the time, no, let's look into it. Oh, it's, it's the, uh, you know, it's the file system. And they don't believe that, of course. So we were like, well, how can we convince them? Researchers love graphs. They understand graphs. We had to be able to produce graphs to be able to say, no, you see, the problem is not, it doesn't exist here, it exists here. Here are some solutions how to correct this problem. So we were, we were looking for a, a solution to be able to, you know, a way to present them with a graph or, you know, even present us with alarms to let them know that, hey, you know, your file system's at 100% utilization. You know, you might want to know that before you start, you know, complaining or you start wanting to run another, another big job because you're going to start uh, clab uh, clobbering each other. And we also wanted to allow some flexibility so that Nagios could interact with this solution and uh, or also um, Cacti. And we also wanted to minimize the impact of, of monitoring because, hmm, all right. We wanted to minimize the impact in the sense that I don't want my Nagio s server bogging down waiting for the results of IOSTAT. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with IOSTAT, but if you run IOSTAT from the command line once, it'll get, it's a best guess. It's pretty much giving you garbage. It's just like, I don't really know what the answer is. So you have to run it and let it do a check again to get actually more accurate results than what it gives you the first time. So knowing that the first result is garbage, uh, we have a script that goes, we actually have a cron job that goes out, runs IOSTAT for, uh, a, it runs it for uh, the first time, disregards the first results and waits 30 seconds and takes that second result and puts it in a little cache file and it's like slash temp. And then I have another, uh, the actual script that updates the OIDs goes through. Um, no, all right, second. So, so this, the second. All right, so this is what. Here's the logic behind it. So the second result uh, script, my little IOSTAT Python script, goes and reads that temp file and says, "Oh, okay, you know, creates the index of, of everything. This file system has this for average wait time, average read, you know, utilization and stuff like this, and it updates the OID tree." So then I'm able to access those OIDs. I query those OIDs and it gives me the results. And, and so that right there offloads some of the, the work that you know, Cacti or Nagios would have to do if it had to sit around and wait for the actual results. And if you're pulling things every minute, waiting around 30 seconds, could have um, disastrous effects on you. And that's pretty much all I got. Is there any questions? So this is the way how you update the information uh, for uh, net SNMP. Yeah. So you can query the information. Uh, I have one question about SNMP tree structure. Mm -hmm. Can you can you go back to yeah, the sure, way I'll how you present the, uh, that, that? No, the the black one, the black. Uh, this one. No, the other one. This one. Okay. Why why is it structured the way that you have um, number? So so the first line is one three one one. Oh okay. And 
and the 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 information about the file system is one three two one. Why don't you make it one three one two? As in, why why don't you swap the last two numbers so it's more easy to to parse? All right, I I think I okay. I see what you're saying. Because if if you if you then get information about one three one, you get the the name of the file system, then the number of I/O nodes, mm -hmm. and the actual index file. Is this is this the way how SNMP natively does it, or? Uh, no, no. I actually had to set the structure up. I uh, like I said, Cacti kind of prefers an index for something. So this first result, so this is actually living in, so this right here is the, the private root of the tree. This is our, you know, CHPC's uh, branch that we've created. One is, uh, is the area that we've uh, used for file systems. So we put the inode checks in there, which that's what three is. And we have like a 1.2, which is like, you know, IO stat stuff. So what we've done is um, basically so dot one, so you can ignore all this part right down here. So this dot one, that's the, uh, you know, that's the index. So one dot one, that's the first item in this index. And then this, you know, like two dot one, that's what the file system name is going to be. And then three dot one will be the corresponding to what inode count it is. So that, that's kind of why we did that. Is, does that answer your question or am I need to clear it up a little bit Just more? Just from the object-oriented kind of thinking. Uh-huh. I would probably, you know, swap the last, the last two numbers. Okay. So if I get, you know, one two three dot one dot three dot one, and everything behind that. Oh, okay. Okay. So I would get, you know, all the information in one query. Okay, I see. Then, then you know, in the object kind of way. Okay. Yeah. You can you can totally do that. Like I said, the flexibility of the SNMP pass module allows you to you know, basically structure your your tree structure any way you like. So like you said, everything, you know, this middle, this number right here would be three, and then you'd have like dot one or something would be the index, dot two would be the name, dot three. I see exactly what you're saying. You can do that. That, that flexibility is uh, totally up to you with the with the scripting ability. Um, SNMP, the pass module allows you to add, you know, integers like I have in there or strings or gauges or counters or whatever else you want. And you can totally structure it any way you'd like. Yeah. Oh, so it's basically like the first item, the first count of the index, or the second count of the description, and then the third count yeah. of the body. But like I said, you know, you're, you know, once you create your own branch, you're free to do whatever you'd want to do with it. You're not, you don't have to follow a, a standard. That's, that's, that flexibility might be a benefit to you the way you're asking about it. So, is there any other questions? of the IOSTAT uh, Python um, script that you had that you were using to update the values uh, periodically? I can get an example. Yeah, if you could get one and just send it to us so we could package it to maybe together with your presentation. Okay, sure. For other people that are looking for live examples. Okay. Uh, and, and oh, I could actually show you a live example of what it, our graphs look like if you'd like to see that. Sure, that would be great too. All right, if I connect it to the internet here. Okay. Got to sign on here to the. Are these the access codes to the wireless internet right in this room, or? All right. Sorry about that. I didn't really plan to actually have to do this, but I'm more. We have plenty of time. I'm more than willing to show you anything you guys like and see, see about this.
Does it matter which one we're in? Yes, yes it is. All right, so as you can see, you know, this this um, is IOSTAT graph for the bytes per second that you, you can get out of there. Uh, this, you know, it's running on the file server. I forgot to mention that. These scripts will run on the whatever device you're actually you know, running. So it will be run locally. So that, like I said, that offloads some of the uh, work that Nagio has, has to do. So these run on the file server. The file server provides, provides this graph, this information at SNMP. Cacti, we're usually utilizing Cacti to, to go out and query this stuff for this particular host. And as you can see, you know, it gives, wow, they're actually kind of not really doing anything today. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> so it'll, it'll actually show, um, you know, basically whatever you'd like. And we can, we provide, this is how we provide the uh, data to the users without having to give them a login to Cacti or something like that. And so this, you know, they'll show you the, like, Bytes per second. Uh, uh, we can also do the queue size, uh, request size, uh, request per second, uh, the time things have to wait, uh, and utilization. It seems to be the, the the one they're most interested in. As you can see, they they peak up pretty high, like you know, 100 percent or. You know, like last night apparently was uh, pretty bad. So I mean, this providing this graph to people that you know they, it gives them a chance to say, maybe I ought to check these statistics before I go and complain that there's a problem. And if <laughs> you you guys know how it is, if you can if you can keep the users happy and keep them informed, it makes your life easier. And when there's an actual problem, you know they're you, you know they're just not full of you know blowing smoke your way or something like that. Yeah, that's true, but. Oh. At the university, do you, do you guys just generally uh, uh, know the OIDs that you've created, or have you created MIBs for those to be able to map those out so they're a little bit easier to read? No, I mean I, in your real life. I I scenario? have a uh, wiki page that has them. I mean, there's only like three or four of them. We don't really use them that much. I gotcha. But, but in was, a in a large environment, if you're going to monitor a lot of different items, you would yes. ideally be able to just create your own custom MIB. Absolutely. Put it on the um, put it on the server so it knows what each of those items Absolutely. map out to. Yeah, and another thing, if you're you know you have a creating a you know a software package or something like that, and you say, hey, I want to you know we have statistics that we can get by running these commands, you know, hey, maybe we want to ex extend this, you know, use this ability to extend uh, our package to even you know to the community out there, stuff like that. Right. So, excellent. But there, you know, you could create a, a MIB file. But we we don't have enough to me for me to justify learning how to do that. Yeah, if you have a, a lot of data and you were especially like you mentioned, if you're going to put it in a software package, you wanted to have uh, people be able to query those and have uh, you know user readable stuff, so they know that these are the index and these are the descriptions and these are the actual values um, mm -hmm. that you're returning. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Python library to create um, or to extend the SNMP tree. Is there yes. a way how to extend that tree without using a library? Like, w what is expected from that script to return or to do without using the library? Like, because you you sh you show the SNMPD .conf uh -huh. configuration line. Um, could I just run any type of script? Or bash script, and what what is SNMP daemon looking, f you know, waiting to to be to be returned from that script? Okay. Yeah, a, yeah as that you, one. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, what this does is to answer your question. Yes, 
you can query, there, there's something called pass. There's, there's, there's two options. There's pass and pass persistent. Pass will re pass the request onto a script that will take that as input and do something with it. So you, you're absolutely right. You can run that in real time. Uh, the pass persist, what this allows it to do is to constantly update those results. So if you have a query that takes, you know, it's not instantaneous, like the, the IO stat, for example, it, you, we have to wait a minute to get valid results. This is constantly updating every minute. So I don't have to pass the OID to it, sit around and wait a minute because my you know SNMP is going to time out unless you tell it not to before I get a result. So that's what this this what the pass persist allows us to do is persistently update this. But you are correct. You could just pass an OID to it and say, "Hey, this OID, give me some results." Okay, actually, actually I'm <clears throat> I'm asking different thing. Oh, For okay. example, if if there is a we have lots of different operating systems on the network. Oh, okay. And because these checks are running on the actual system mm -hmm. uh, we're very limited in a way what libraries can we install on those systems you know we have AIXs, HP Unixes and so on so it's sometimes very difficult actually it's not possible to install any additional libraries on that on that system um, and we, we also are not running Python or we don't have Python installed on those systems so I'm, I'm kind of asking if you just run a very simple bash script mm -hmm. or shell script and you put that script into SNMPD configuration like this, mm -hmm. either as pass or pass persist, what is SNMP daemon uh, expecting that that Python th script or any other script will return? So can I just return a number and that number will be available through that no. OID? It's expecting a, uh, a type of, of thing. So it's expecting it to know what type it is. It, uh, instead of just say I'm going to pass the name, it wants to know this is a string, and what follows is the actual string. This is a counter, and stuff like that. So you'll have to pass what type of variable that value is. So if you're like, well, this this is you know this is just a string of a of a name of a host name or something like that. You'll tell you'll that's you know I believe your Bash script will say okay, you, you know SNMP this is the string, and then this is what the value is. So it has to know what that is. So you just can't push. You just can't pass the name of the host name. You'll have to tell. It has to be a little bit smarter to tell what kind of variable it's it's getting. I believe I don't. I haven't done it in Bash, but I believe that's how it works. Because I looked at the uh, at the Python library, and it basically it's just a bunch of wrappers for stuff. And I think I believe it is telling. This is what kind of variable it is, and this is what the value is. I think that's on the basic level. That's exactly what it does. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Uh, I'd like to thank Nagios for uh, letting me come out here, and I also thank the guys out in the community because, like I said, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that got, uh, people put out there. You know, like plugins or stuff like that. I also like to thank my uh, employer, uh, CHPC. Uh, go ahead and check us out on the website. You know, I don't mind to plug us. We're actually it's pretty cool what we do. We do a lot of uh, support a lot of cool research. So. Uh, Feel free to check us out, and that's pretty much all I have. All right.